First, let me welcome all of you here. This is uh, kind of a special time every year when we, we see the university really getting engaged with the community and bringing in people that are really interesting. And of course, right now in this world, nothing is more important than kind of the social aspect of what we're doing. And I want to start by making an observation or two about what goes on in Columbia and how we look at things. It's, it's like being on a roller coaster with you here. I've been here a long time. I'm the entrepreneur in residence at the business school, and my name is Cliff Shore. And I came here first in 1993. So when it first went through the dot-com boom, and everybody was leaving that $100 million ideas on the back of the matchbook, and we kind of went into the post-dot-com boom when everybody was thoroughly depressed. And then it worked our way back up. Now we have a, a group that we, again, thoroughly depressed, but we also have an emerging trend, which is terrific. And that is people who are looking to do projects and get involved in companies, businesses, and people that really are socially conscious. And we see this in the investment community, we see it in the business community. There's heightened consciousness of what's not just good for business, but the old theme of doing good while doing well. So we've got some of these people here today that are going to present to you. It's pretty exciting. The format will be each one will make a, just a brief two-minute presentation, and then a big gong goes off. And then you have uh, three minutes for a Q&A, so we will move pretty quickly, and you'll listen to each other. And we have a, you know, a fine panel of judges here who are going to be listening, all very involved in that part of the community. They will be voting on them and discussing among themselves. Following the presentations, we'll have about 15 minutes of open Q&A. So you can ask them questions, clarifications, or for opinions, give feedback. And uh, then the judges will come together and we're going to give them our results. And we'll kind of announce the way that uh, kind of came to the top of the OK? Any questions on that format? All right, good. So let me take a moment then introduce our, our judges who will then introduce themselves. So Laura, why don't you go ahead and tell them a little bit about the background. And we'll sure. Well, first of all, thank you. I'm really glad to be here. My name is Laura Galinsky. Vice President of an organization called Echoing Green. Essentially, Echoing Green, we're, we're seed funders and social change, and we were started by a private equity firm about almost 25 years ago. So we're in the business of helping seed social change organizations, nonprofit, for profit hybrid. I'm also joined here by my colleague, um, Nitty, who's in the back, <laughs> as well as Erica, who is um, a graduate of Columbia Business School. Thank you very much. Okay, Johnson. Hi, I'm Jonathan Kaufman. I'm a, a director and founding partner of 1% Foundation. We were started in 2007 by a group of about 30 of us that uh, realized we, we voted, we volunteered, we were active, but we didn't give money because nobody ever asked us to give money. And when they did, we were thinking we could only probably give, you know, 50 bucks, 75 bucks. So we came together and formed a giving circle um, and started with 30 of us and quickly added a lot of our friends. And now we're about 300 people across the country. Um, Raising about, uh, raised about $110,000 so far. Uh, goal is to, by 2013, have 10,000 people and be giving out about $3 million a year. Um, and all of our uh, nominee, all of our grants are um, user nominated. So anyone who's giving that 1%, which is the criteria to be in the 1% giving circle, can nominate organizations. Uh, we focus in environment, health, education, poverty, and international aid. And uh, then we all get together, we learn about them, we assess the organizations, and we vote on where we want to give our money collectively. I like that phrase, giving so. It's, it's, it's really cool. Okay. It's been good. It's been effective. That's great. Dan? Hi, I'm Dan Mitchell from the TED Conference. I work specifically on the TED Prize, which is an award that we've given out every year for the last eight years. We um, provide the prize winner with $100,000, but more importantly, a wish to change the world. Um, and my job is to help leverage all the assets that we have at TED within the TED community to make social change on a global scale. Um, we, we elect winners from sort of across all the sectors that TED represents. So. Everyone from Jamie Oliver, who's the chef who we're helping create a food revolution for in the U.S., to Bill Clinton, Bono, um, to oceanographer Sylvia Earle. So we work across a long, a large ra range of issues. Um, I've been doing it pretty well so far. Great. Thank you very much. Well, I think we've got a terrific team here. Thanks for being here. Okay, uh, you're, you're gonna get right into it because you really came here to hear the presentation. So we're going to kick it off with Phil Westcott. You're up first, and. Uh, Phil's going to tell, did you say Glovico? Glovico. Glovico. Phil, it's all Right, hi, yeah, my name's Phil Westcott. I'm actually uh, an MBA grad here at Columbia on exchange from ESA Business School in Barcelona. And it was in, uh, can we just have the slides? <laughs> Otherwise everyone will know what I say. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, just uh, just do the slideshow view if you could. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, next slide. Okay, so this is our this is our front page. Uh, this is our website. We went live in in May of this year, and. The whole concept around Globico is the flow of revenue to the base of the pyramid. So what we've done is flip the conventional wisdom that Western communities have to educate the developing world. Because our teachers here are all from uh, emerging economies, all from poor communities where they are the entrepreneurial types, they're the thought leaders, and they're the educators. So we have teachers from the Spanish-speaking world in Guatemala, in Peru, in San Salvador. Uh, our French teachers are from uh, locations such as Senegal, uh, Ivory Coast. Next slide, please. Now, the value proposition is also for our students. Because in addition to the excellent value, the convenience, the effective learning over Skype, that what you really get from this experience is a cultural exchange with your teacher in the developing world. I, for one, am learning Spanish from uh, a guy called Victor in Guatemala, and we share an interest in soccer and in environmental issues, and we talk about this as part of our lesson. So I've really found that this is a rich part of the experience of Global Cup. This is our team. As you can see, we're fairly uh, European-based at present. But part of the reason I came to Colombia was trying to open up the network over here with events such as uh, we had this conference today. And this is just one little story I wanted to give you that shows the, the power of Globico. So far in, in four months, we've, we've ramped up our, our lessons quite substantially. To the point last month, we, uh, we achieved uh, 500 lessons in a month. And in one of those, in one of those lessons, Yanatau, just 10 more seconds. Yanatau, <laughs> with, with one of her students, formed a, a social partnership, a social venture that together they're now launching in Senegal. <coughs> now, I'm uh, happy to take any questions that you have about Globico. I, guess, yeah, I can jump in here. Um, I'm curious about what role you see this playing in the US, where we've got a population that has all of these native speakers locally. Um, why do this online when we can do it face to face here? Uh, there's a certain convenience about having it online. You can do it to your schedule. You can do it before you go to work in the morning. You can do it uh, at the end of the day. Uh, there's also the cost element. I don't, I don't think you'll find a, a one hour language lesson for less than nine bucks uh, anywhere in the US. And thirdly, there's the, the, the social good, and it attracts a certain kind of student. Can you highlight the social good a little bit more? How is this uh, going to create social change? OK, so at, at the moment, our growth strategy is purely based on a bootstrapping model where we are, we are doing improvised marketing. Said, having said that, we, we aim with that conservative model to achieve 200, uh, 200, lessons, uh, 200 lessons a week by the end of 2012. And when we achieve that, that means we will have flown, uh, flowed uh, $1 million to these teachers in their economies by the end of 2012. How do, you, uh, how do you identify who the tutors are? Uh, initially, we, we had a screening for our, our first set of tutors in each location. Uh, and then through their references, uh, we, we screen future teachers. The moment we've got 12, uh, and that's, that's not the, uh, the limiting factor at the moment. <coughs> we're, we're trying to grow the student base. There's, there's enough capacity in our teachers at the moment. Do you provide any kind of training to the teachers? Yeah, we do. We've got um, teacher trainers from uh, uh, French and Spanish, and that, and that works in reverse direction. So they're actually teaching over Skype uh, remotely. Do you mind breaking down the financial models just a little bit of if, so if someone's paying for the lesson, how much that's actually going to the tutor versus going to the organization? $2.40 goes to the organization out of the $9. That covers our costs um, and our, our uh, long term vision is that any additional profit we make will be reinvested into these communities, giving them better infrastructure, better internet connections. 
so that they can provide this service with, uh, uh, with greater numbers. What's your quality control mechanism? Uh, it's self-selecting, really, because as a student, you can go in, as you can see, each of our teachers is rated on five dimensions. Timeliness, competence, friendliness, action, and connectivity of the connection. So, uh, yeah, when our, our, teachers, uh, our teachers are graded, and then when new students come to the site, they will select the ones <coughs> that have got the best ratings, and perhaps the ones that like something that's in their profile. Are you planning to work within school district, or ha how, how are you, it's, it's based on someone's interest in getting trained in another language, but are you going to work in some sort of systems way, so working with, uh, who, explain your client on who wants to learn another language. Okay, we've had, we've had two um, markets we target at the moment, individual uh, students that we've targeted over web and general awareness, uh, we went out on uh, the BBC World, World Service on the radio, and this morning on, uh, on the BBC website. So there's individuals that, that we're putting in. But we're also talking to schools and educational uh, groups because there's uh, massive potential for this both in education in the language but also cultural awareness. So we really feel that there's an impact we can have in, in the developed world as much as in the developing world. Okay, I think we'll cut it off there. Thank you very much. Thank you. The way we educate people in the world is going to change dramatically. And I'll share with you just a, a quick little story. Um, I taught in Tanzania earlier this year. And uh, when I was there, I went up to see the lions and all the things that you do there. And I was seen in the side all over with their little sticks and herbs and such. And I became very curious. And I said to a, a guide there, you know, I said, Can I go to see one of the <coughs> villages? And he said, Sure, if you pay a little thing, we'll take you to the village. They took me to this village, which was one of the most primitive places I've ever been in my life. I had cattle wandering around, and no electricity, and no running water. Very, very primitive lifestyle. So they said, would you like to meet the medicine man? I said, sure. So I went, and the king was there with his steak, and you know, said hello to him, and tried to communicate a little bit. And this is in the middle of nowhere. I turned to walk away, and all of a sudden, I heard this sound <coughs> that startled me. Anybody guess what it was? No, it's not it's not it's not 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 that <laughs> and it made me realize how connected we're going to be. So when I see something like this, this is just the beginning of how this will quickly share knowledge. So congratulations to you. So Rachel, I think Rachel's up next. Rachel Chong, X5. Rachel Chong, and I'm the founder and CEO of Catch a Fire, a for-profit social mission technology company that has built an online marketplace that matches nonprofits and social enterprises to professionals who want to volunteer their skills. You can think of us as a match.com for nonprofits and professionals. The problem that we're solving is huge. 95% <coughs> of all nonprofits in America say that they need and want skills-based volunteers but don't know where to go to access them. On the other side of the equation, we, have, we estimate that there are approximately 25 million professionals in the US who want to volunteer their skills but don't have an easy way to do so. In fact, in New York City, <coughs> which has the highest density of highly skilled professionals, we see the lowest volunteer rate in the country. This isn't because New Yorkers don't want to give. It's because no one has made it easy for them to do so in an efficient and impactful way. Catch a Fire makes it easy for the professional to volunteer their skills and for the nonprofit to identify and articulate their needs. Different than any other volunteer matching site, we create predefined, pre scoped projects and the technology to provide the volunteer with a tailored list of volunteer projects that match their skills and their cause interests. On the other side, we deliver to the nonprofit a perfect volunteer match for their specific skills-based project need. In other words, our technology allows us to serve as a scalable volunteer headhunter for the nonprofit, saving them time in creating a project, 
finding volunteers, and vetting them to find the right one. We deliver all of this to the nonprofit for a small match fee of $200. Catch a Fire Soft launched in May of this year, and since then we've registered 500 nonprofits and 3,000 volunteers in New York City. Last month we launched our new beta site, which was built by our CTO, Andrew Lin, who was the founding VP of technology at Hulu. With our new site live, our goal is to scale up in New York City, increasing the number of professionals and nonprofits that we serve by 200% by this year's end. With this success, we'll expand nationwide to serve nonprofits and professionals all over the country. Please join us by visiting www.catchafire.org. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I guess um, one of the first things that comes to my mind is that you're saying that you're going to be able to save these nonprofits time um, in doing this. I would think that the nonprofits that have the hardest time finding expertise in volunteers are the smaller nonprofits that don't even have the time to probably apply for this. Um, how, do you, um, how do you work through that? What are you guys thinking in terms of freeing up time for them? That is exactly um, what we do, actually. So we have this project menu, which basically is um, about 30 projects been pre-scoped and pre-defined, and what that means is that over the past year, um, we've interviewed hundreds of nonprofits here in New York City asking them what their skills-based needs are. We found that they're asking for the same thing over and over again, and so what we do is we pre-template, we templatize projects for the nonprofit. So they come to our projects menu, they identify that they need a logo design, for instance. Um, the logo design project has a set deliverable and a pre, and it, the project is actually scoped. Um, this it saves the nonprofit time in actually creating a project. Um, and then what happens is that when they click find a volunteer, our matching algorithm actually delivers them a volunteer that specifically matches this need as well as who they are in terms of their cause area um, and other characteristics that, that they've shared with us. So we actually do save them time in recruiting volunteers, vetting volunteers, and then managing volunteers because our type of volunteers are skill-based experts that work on this specific project. And so in fact, the nonprofit saves a lot of time in not having to manage this expert. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. So, um, thank you. The, so skills, creating an efficiency around skills base, I, I get that, but so much of, um, what I've seen in terms of creating a really good match has to do with uh, sort of cultural match between the organization or the person who would be managing the volunteer and the uh, volunteer. Uh, so I'm curious to how that has uh, played into anything that you are setting up or how has that been a liability in terms of matches that you've already made? I don't think it's a liability at all. It's something that we $200 fee per volunteer, or is it a service fee? It's a, it's a service fee, a match fee for every project match. So yes, for every volunteer. Got it. And are you focusing on virtual opportunities or physical opportunities or both? Like logo design, for example, could be done um, virtually, and you can sort of outsource it from wherever. Most of our projects are virtual because of the nature. They're by nature skills based. So mm -hmm. these are, you know, marketing, social media, PR, strategy, technology, finance. Um, so a lot of these projects can be done virtually. However, we're um, only in New York right now, and the reason for that is we do believe that there is a lot of um, there's a lot of value. 
value when the volunteer and the nonprofit are able to meet in person. Even if it's just one time, that face-to-face -face interaction in the first meeting really holds people accountable. And so as we think about expanding nationwide, this is one of the biggest issues that we, our biggest challenge is to think about, okay, now that they actually don't have the ability to meet in person face-to-face, -face, how do we ensure that they are still accountable to each other? Okay. Thank you very much. Javier was a college student who wanted to change the world. He wanted to work for one of these super sexy visible, visible social impact organizations that brings clean water to India or malaria medication to Africa. And so he applied for these organizations and was sadly rejected and he was depressed. So instead we said to him, well, why don't you just pick up the trash that's littered in front of your apartment? That's actually something that you can do that will benefit the community. Ha, he scoffed. That's not sexy. That doesn't change the world. Okay. So what if we all chipped in and paid you, and then we let everyone know what a great job you did with this? He was intrigued. So what if there were more people like Javier out there, people who just needed a little extra push to take on the small projects that make their community better? And if you took all these small projects together, then wouldn't that sum to a super sexy, visible social impact movement that changes the world? Longtail Grants is an online crowdfunding website that enables high school, college, and graduate students to raise money for themselves, so then they can go out and start, implement, and perhaps even profit from their own socially beneficial activities. Think of it as a Kickstarter.com for youth social impact and community engagement, a site that's solely intended to help 13 to 30 year olds get more involved in their community. By not, uh, by not requiring these students to be associated with a nonprofit organization, we intend to change the spectrum of social impact and empower the individual. Students will have the opportunity to create or first apply for, create, and then share their own profile pages which advertises their projects that picks up trash on the street or plants gardens or paints murals or researches solar cells or possibilities are endless. Instead of just encouraging students to volunteer in their communities, we want to incent them. That way we can target an entirely new population of youth, those that may not necessarily have the luxury to just volunteer, but those who might need to earn money in order to make significant contributions in their society. Longtail Grants is a for-profit organization that will earn money through transactions and eventually through an innovative enterprise and sponsorship model with large companies and their employees. Okay. <laughs> so uh, the first major thing that comes to my mind is aren't, aren't you just fostering bad habits of trying to get people to think about volunteering in a selfish way? Why would you make them necessarily be selfish? The way that we think about it is that if people are out there making a difference in the world, then that's a good thing. Because you can make the argument that social entrepreneurship is selfish if you're going to earn money from trying to start something that helps the world. But, but shouldn't that guy pick up the trash in his neighborhood because that's the right thing to do? Not because he's not going to like try to market that as how much money will my community pay me to pick up this trash? <clears throat> that's a good point. The way that I see it though is that if people are willing to pay someone to do that and to pay him to do that, then that's a good thing. Beyond just the impact created from picking up trash on the street, we hope that this also encourages more youths to realize, oh, being involved in the community is a good thing to do, and that that can have resonating effects from there after. So the, just to clarify, the money is not necessarily just to pay them personally, but also for expenses in organizing their projects, or is it just to pay them personally? It's both. So we have a budget on the site, so it's part of the application process. All the grantees are required to fill out their expected expenses and so forth. This is to help them think about what they actually need to start, implement, and run their projects. They'll be visible and transparent on the website. If beyond that, the, stu the student wants to raise more money beyond that, if they're able to do so, then we encourage them to do so. I see. And uh, there are a lot of organizations out there that try are trying to cultivate a, um, uh, a culture of, of giving ar among young people. So I'm thinking of kind of youth noise and do something.org and, and and so you're saying that the the biggest difference is the ba the ability to fundraise. So sort of like the the donors choose/kickstarter slash aspect of it. 
Absolutely. We've done a lot of research, and as part of our research was we st started talking to high school students in Philadelphia that grew up in communities that just didn't know about volunteers, but they had volunteers come to their school. And we said, well, how would we get you involved in your community? And their answer was simple. So we're not necessarily trying to change any fundamental reasons why people want to get involved. We're just trying to play to that. Sorry, their answer was simple. What was their answer? Sorry, their answer was simple, saying that if we had money and we had some respect for what we were doing. Uh -huh. So, and respect for what we're doing, it'd be one thing to say that every day I uh, buy a burrito and give it to someone who needs it on the street. But in our society, it carries more cachet to say that you work for a nonprofit that does that. So what we want to do is just to try, try to create a brand that says, well, if you can do it yourself, and you're actually directly creating that impact, that's good too. How do you ensure accountability? Is there any kind of rating system? Good, good question. Um, Essentially, we're going to have a direct communication mechanism, so that way, unlike most donations to more opaque organizations, we require all the grantees on the site to, within a set time frame, update their profile page with the process, with their progress. So this can be in the form of videos, or pictures, or tweets, or Facebook status updates that just let the site know, let their donors know that they're actually doing what they say that they're going to be doing. And in the event that after a set period of time they don't do that, then we freeze their ability to raise money for them. Out of curiosity, as, a, as somebody who donates, um, mm -hmm. right, if you guys are for profit, I'm not going to be able to get the, um, any kind of tax credit for that, no, right, no tax deduction from that. So why would I, as a donor, why would I donate to this instead of to a nonprofit that's doing something similar in the area? Good question. Uh, for many reasons. One, we think that most of the donations that will be funneled through the site will be relatively small. We expect that most of the donations to be anywhere mm -hmm. from 5 to $20 for total projects that are just a few hundred dollars. And so in some research that we did, uh, it seems as if a lot of individuals who donate that small of sums aren't as concerned with the tax deductibility of it. It's why people will just donate to bake sales and, and give things of that nature. Um, and that's perhaps the main reason. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. You know, when I listen to these young people, it makes me reflect on having watched this type of momentum being built at school. And I'll share with you a quick story. Does anybody here know Andrea Winner? how to play. I had a student come in to me, a uh, program I run at Columbia is to launch new companies. And she came in to me about five years ago. We sat down, I still remember the meeting very well, and she said, do you know there are 300 elementary schools in New York City that have no playgrounds? And I said, no, I got up this morning not knowing that. <laughs> she said, well, it's a fact. And she said, I'm gonna fix that. And I kind of looked at her like, sure. <laughs> so, so I had to do that. So we developed a plan, she went around and took pictures, and what had happened in New York City over the years, over in the last hundred years, is playgrounds had been covered up by blacktop and became parking lots and they took away the original children's playground. So she went around and she took pictures of all of these, got a contractors and bids and such, what it would cost to build the playground. And she started this upon graduation, which would have been in 2006. This fall, we will celebrate 100 playgrounds being built in City. She has raised $30 million by herself with one employee. And it taught me a phenomenal lesson of the power of one. When you have something good you want to do, how people will line up behind you. And it, I reflect on it as I listen to these young folks make their pitches. There's tremendous potential in these things. So, Mark, was that? <coughs> So, Dan, my apologies. But, um, so, my name's Mark Bush. I'm the founder of Journey Universal. And I, I'm just going to start with a quick question. So, everyone here who has donated blood in the last six months, can you raise your hand? So, that, that's actually not too bad. And I also want to say that we're in a room with some of the most well intentioned, altruistic, and educated people <laughs> in New York City. Um, but if you look around, this is a problem, and it's only going to become more of a problem going forward. And this is a problem that Turner Universal is going to solve. So, so why is this happening? Why are there so few blood donors? And the reason is that there's a disconnect now between what blood centers are doing to market towards and recruit potential donors and what people respond to. If you look at these tactics, what they're doing is what they've been doing for the past 15 years. They're using direct mail. They're putting up posters. They're using traditional advertising. And they're making phone calls. Um, and meanwhile, Donors, and especially young people, want to be spoken to through sources that they know and they trust. 
they want to be talked to through their social networks, through their cell phones, and websites like Facebook and Twitter. So enter Donor Universal. So what we're doing is we're building new tools that will one, boost awareness for blood donation by doing things like this, and also better tap into people's motivations. We're bringing proven online trends and technology such as social networking, virtual rewards and badges, and location aware technology to blood donor recruitment. So this is a double bottom line business. So the first thing is the viability and security of our nation's blood supply going forward will depend on our ability to recruit and also to cultivate younger blood donors who are not in the supply chain right now. And second, not only will these tools better recruit and retain blood donors, but it's a compelling business. They'll do it at a fraction of the cost of what's currently being done. Blood centers now spend about $250 million a year solely on recruiting, and we think that we can capture a good chunk of that. How will you work with existing blood centers or hospitals or what exists? Right, so our clients are gonna be the blood centers or other collection places such as hospitals that, that have a blood bank on their premises. So, um, so one thing that, that we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to integrate with their current CRMs and, um, and the biggest challenge that we have is, is getting the cooperation of the blood centers in terms of um, reporting when donors make donations, getting their blood type information from them and things like that. So, so that's, um, so, 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 so the idea would be that every time that someone goes and donates blood, there's a feedback mechanism that they send the information on the, what was donated, when it was donated, and the blood type to us so that we can make it seamless with, with our tools. What kind of uh, client confidentiality issues are there in terms of giving out names with medical stuff? So blood donation is regulated by the FDA. Um, it's not regulated by, by HIPAA. So, so, um, so obviously there's certain confidential information in terms of blood types, in terms of when people are making um, donations at, at blood centers. But if donors give them permission to report back to us, then, um, then there's no, as long as we get them to opt in, um, there's, there's no issues with that. And current organizations aren't developing their own mobile tools? So blood centers are, are starting to, to look at social. And the way that they're doing it is they, they have Twitter feeds now, and they have Facebook fan pages. So they're not fully, fully harnessing the power. Um, there are a couple of reasons why I think that, that they haven't fully gone after this and, and done it. Um, the first reason is that blood recruitment is highly local. So blood centers in New York are concerned with getting blood donors in New York. Um, and there's a scale issue. So, so no one blood center is really big enough to, to make an investment that's needed to build smart tools like this. Um, another issue is that um, culturally, um, blood centers are not the most innovative places. Where's the money for this coming from? Like, how, how is this funded? What's the, what's how the is this funded? Yeah. Or, or what is the revenue model? Um, both. both. So, so the revenue model is, um, is lead generation. So every, every appointment that's generated using our tools, every donor that we refer, we will collect a fee for every unit of blood that's collected. And that fee- From the, from the donor, from the from, blood from center. From the blood center, they will pay us. And that will be between 12 and $15. If you look at, there, there are firms mm -hmm. out there that have this model right now, and those firms are recruiting people through telemarketing they're charging 40 to $50 per appointment that they generate, which is quite a lot. And the reason that they have to charge that much is that telemarketing doesn't work and it's expensive. Um, and the, the other part of the question was, was funding. So, um, so that's where organizations like Echo and Green come in and, <laughs> and other things like that. So, so right now, um, putting the final touches on the, the product ideas and the business plan. And um, you know, I think that there could be a lot of interest in this both grants, um, different, different uh, medical communities that are affected by blood donations, such as cancer community. Um, they may have an interest in funding this. This, I think, could be a very good business. Um, for profit or social investors could have an interest in this as well. Thank you very much.
way not to win a pitch competition is to come about 10 minutes late, so I apologize for that. Um, one of the most difficult things about starting a charter school is finding a facility. And in the two years that I spent working to open Coney Island Prep, I definitely found that to be true. When we opened in August 2009 to 95th grade students, I'm proud to say that we became the first public charter school to open a New York City Housing Authority housing project. Despite the tremendous challenges that come with any startup organization, we had an incredibly successful first year of operation. On the Department of Education progress reports that came out last week, we were ranked the 17th best public school in the city, the third best middle school, and the second best charter school. Despite that success, we still face incredible challenges. Chancellor Klein and Mayor Bloomberg have both cited our creative challenge to the, our creative solution to the facility's challenge of located in a housing project. As an example, they would like to see replicated citywide, if not nationwide. Despite that, we've grown into we've we've grown into a limitation in our space. Right now, we have 180 students in 8,000 square feet, and we can't expand anymore. Our growth model is to double in size over the next two years. In order to do that, we need to find a new facility. We've identified a 31,000 square foot former Catholic school. It's a beautiful building that would allow us to double in size over the next two years. Uh, unfortunately, it requires some renovations before you can move in. Nothing structural, basically just cosmetic things, but uh, the price tag is about a million dollars. The way charter schools are funded, about 80% of our funding comes from public sources on a per pupil allocation, but that doesn't take into account any cost for facilities. So that million dollars and the rent that we'll pay on going, we need to come up with on our own. So we've raised $100,000 privately to date, but require $900,000 more in order to be able to grow into this new space uh, so that we can double in size over the next two years and continue the wonderful start that we made this past year. So what makes, uh, well, congratulations on your success. Thank you. That's amazing. Um, so what makes Coney Island Prep Public Charter School unique what I heard from you is where it's located. Mm -hmm. What else? Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't discount the uniqueness of where it's located, just in that South Brooklyn is an incredibly diverse part of the city. And most charter schools, the majority of charter schools serve a majority of <coughs> minority population. Um, our school is incredibly diverse, uh, ethnically, religiously, et cetera. So while 76% of our students qualify for free or reduced price lunch, so they live in poverty. Um, about 40% of our students are black or African American, 25% are Hispanic, 20% are white. Um, of which the majority are second generation Russian immigrants, and 10% are Asian. So when people come and visit the school, that's usually the first thing they comment on, because it's very obvious when you step into a classroom just how diverse it is. And I think it's one of the things that makes Coney Island Prep really special. Another big uh, critique, or another criti a critique that's been of charter schools recently is that they don't serve special education or ELL populations. 28% of our students actually are classified as special ed, and 10% is ELL, both of which are higher percentages than, than the district that we're in. Um, so I think all of those combine to contribute to something that makes money on prep. Um, so teacher merit pay, teacher performance evaluation is a pretty hot topic, uh, especially for charter schools. I'm curious what you guys do to evaluate teachers and how you work with that in your system. So um, to begin, our teachers, our core school day goes from 7.30 to 5 for students. So for teachers, it's obviously longer than that. Um, so to begin, we just pay above the Department of Education pay scale for teachers. And then we offer an additional 10% performance-based pay, uh, merit-based pay. And that's a combination of uh, team incentives and individual incentives. And, and there's a sort of, there, there's a rigorous evaluation process that we've developed internally um, that you know begins from the first day and carries you um, I, I don't want to bore you with the details, but it's linked, it, it, it is linked to that 10% uh, performance-based pay. I will say, it's, it's, I will, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that we've done it perfectly. Right? I think it's something that a lot of uh, charter schools and educational reform community are, are trying to figure out. Uh, you mentioned that you wanted to double in size at your current location. Have you looked at the feasibility <coughs> of scaling to other boroughs, of creating a broader network of schools within housing authority complexes? Yeah, so 
one of the reasons we were able to form this partnership with the housing authorities is they used to operate hundreds um, of community centers across the city, but they ran out of money to actually operate them. So they have all these community centers citywide that are vacant. Um, most of them were in an 8,000 square foot facility, and that's one of the larger ones. So they're just not of a size that will allow you to grow into, we're eventually going to be grades 5 through 12. Uh, they don't have facilities that are of the size that would allow that to happen. We've had preliminary conversations about the possibility of building on the land, but um, to say that it was a difficult process to negotiate the lease would be an understatement, so the prospect of trying to engage in sort of a big scale construction project with them is more than we can bite off right now. As far as expanding the model, uh, I think one thing that a lot of successful charter schools have done is try to expand too quickly. Um, we're just in our second year, we had a really great first year, but we just doubled in size from last year to this year, and there's still things we're trying to figure out and improve upon. And I wouldn't want to jeopardize the success we've had by trying to grow too quickly. So we're really trying to get this one school right before we think about expanding beyond that. Okay, we'll cut it off there. Thank you. Well, I think you'll agree these pretty impressive young people and sharing their ideas. And I listen about education, and I keep thinking that if you look at the country we have built, one of the great foundations was public education. And it's broken. It needs to be fixed. So ideas like this, new approaches to teaching the young, are, are vital to our future. So I congratulate you on putting forth that effort. So here's what we'll do. Let's, um, if, if I could get all the presenters up here, right, we're going to take questions from you while our judges kind of huddle together and, and come up with uh, their opinions on which of the projects they like. So please direct your questions at them as you see fit. They had very brief presentations and very helpful. I have a question just as, as young people starting um, you know, new businesses, how do you sustain yourself financially as you, as you work on this? <laughs> If we could use the microphone also for, for the video. Uh, I've, been a, I've been at business school for the last uh, 14 months, so that's given me some, an opportunity to, to work alongside my studies. Um, going forward, obviously, this is a crucial point where you made the decision between um, working for a, for a company or going alone. So it's kind of a, a topical point for me at the moment. Anybody else want to comment on it? <laughs> so that means we have a lot of wealthy people. <laughs> Next question, Tony. I wonder if you guys could comment about how you guys built a team and, and got other people involved who are excited about your same idea. Um, I started my venture with two of my friends from undergrad who we all just shared a common interest in this. Um, the Javier I referenced was actually a friend of mine that was sort of the impetus years ago. Um, in, in terms of building a team, I found it to be relatively easy to start to talk to people who share common interests and find out what exactly they can do. And depending upon the type of organization you are, you can typically find a role for someone in there. So usually it's just if you go out there and start to ask people. That's how I started to do it. I'll speak to this. I, I'm looking to build a team, so, so I don't have one yet. Um, so, so my perspective is um, there's a great community in New York City, um, and there are events such as these, um, other startup events. And I've been starting to, to get out there and, and share this idea more and more. And that's been really helpful in connecting with people. But, but that is, um, you know, one thing that, that I'm looking, I'm looking to connect with a, a technical person who can help me actually build these tools that I'm envisioning. And, and that's, um, you know, good developers are, are, are in demand right now. And, and that's really tough. Um, and they have a lot of options that, that pay them good money. 
So, um, so I think it's just getting out there, sharing your idea, and, um, and going to events such as these. He actually has. <laughs> um, he's one of our nonprofit customers, actually, so I'm really proud about that. Um, finding my team was actually really hard. Lucky you that it was easy, um, especially for my technical co-founder. I actually went through two other people before I found Andrew, um, and it wasn't just two people. It was two people, my entire seed funding, and um, nine months. Um, so it's really hard and I and I think that you know you have to keep looking even if you have somebody in place and if it's not the right person just keep looking um, because it really makes all the difference difference especially when the team you know in the beginning is small my team right now is five people full-time um, but in the beginning I started off with actually six pro bono volunteers who were all um, Duke business school students who graduated and all had really great jobs at places like Microsoft and Deloitte and Bain and they actually um, deferred their jobs to work for me full-time pro bono for nine months. So um, I think that if you have a good idea and you are able to articulate that well, um, especially when it's a social venture, people really will, you know, for me at least, people have really been generous with their time to help build um, um, my company to where it is today. Yeah, I've seen this from both sides because uh, it was at a conference very similar to this back in February at Doing Good, Doing Well in Barcelona that I first encountered the Glovico idea. So I was recruited um, at that point and now I'm at Columbia, I'm using the resources, the amazing resources that Columbia has for social enterprise uh, to, to recruit some of the, the brain power that's available here. For example, the Pangea project. Um, I'm hoping to line up a project um, for, for next term and, and those people who are studying here at Columbia or are familiar with Columbia will know that there are a number of other uh, ways of getting uh, intellectual uh, capacity in, into your ventures. Just a comment I'll share with you and that is from my experience a lot of the great companies do set aside some talent sometimes to do pro bono talent work. Don't be afraid to go to those. Know, you'll find sometimes they'll succumb somebody just to help a company. And, and uh, it's kind of an unconventional way to get non-monetary support for building your enterprise. So something we can do. Yes? I have a question about, um, I guess, IP. Like, how do you protect your idea before it's come to fruition? Because you have to share with a lot of people in order to get funding and to get people on board. So, and especially from your co-team members that you recruit, especially pro bono. <laughs> Uh, my take on this is that there, there are two schools of thought for, for startups that, that are often out there. One is don't share with anyone, and the second is share with everyone. Um, and if you don't share with anyone, no one can steal your idea, but odds are that someone's already thought of it, and you know if they really want to do it, they could do it anyhow. Um, so, so I think for startups, unless you're doing something highly technical and get a lot of money, um, you're not going to have really defensible IP. And a lot of it just comes down to what drives you. Why are you going to get this done? Um, whereas someone else, you know, can do this, but you know, but but isn't. So so I think it, it comes down to motivation. I think that will become more of an issue as you scale your company. If people see it, um, see that's making money, see that it's successful, then you have to start worrying more about that. Just to comment on that, one of the things we tell students all the time at Columbia about ideas is Einstein once said he had two original ideas. And I figure if he only had two original ideas, our chances of having something totally unique is rare. It's all in the execution. It's in getting out there and doing it. So, you know, that's, I think it's more important that you spread the word of what you're trying to do, unless you have a drug patent or something that's of that type. So that's great. Next question. Yes. My question is specifically for Phil. Phil, I loved your idea. I loved all the ideas. But my question is for you specifically. Um, Jonathan alluded to it. Have you considered uh, using native speakers in the US, which I think is really an untapped resource, not only the speakers, but you said you're building up your student base. My experience with ethnic communities is many of them let their language go. Have you considered pursuing that 
as an avenue to, to creating a student base, um, you know, approaching communities or families with this as a tool to preserve the language when, you know, for very various reasons, they may not be doing it in the home. Um, Glovico is sort of founded an objective to, um, to flow revenue to the, the base of the pyramid. So really, we're looking at developing countries with a certain GDP, uh, under a certain GDP threshold. So, I mean, that's where, where we come from. There are for-profit businesses uh, here in the US and, and in Europe that use teaching over Skype um, that do utilize uh, in-country language resources. Um, they're a slightly different objective to us. They're a slightly higher price point. Um, so that's not really who we're competing against. I just wanted to make one comment on that. Was that, I mean, just, uh I'm sorry, I don't know who made, uh, made that point, but just consider remittances, right? I mean, a lot of the money that flows back into to developing countries comes from re remittances from migrants who've come to the country and are now earning here. So it's, I mean, it's just uh, something to think about because a lot of the money that, you know, that flows into developing countries does come from, from immigrants. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very good point. I guess what our objective is getting um, these entrepreneurs in these communities access to that cash. By definition, the immigrants are... Uh, have access to, to cash and employment opportunities here in the US, for instance. Whereas the teachers we're working for are in fairly remote communities in less advanced uh, economies. Have you looked at the one-to-many model? Uh, yes, we've got, um, we've got a couple of pilot schemes we've done with, uh, with classrooms uh, in Germany so far, uh, where one of our teachers, one of our teachers, Javier, uh, in, uh, in Peru, has delivered a couple of classes to, to uh, you know, a, a classroom full of 20 children from Germany. I was thinking, I think maybe you were driving at that a little bit too. You might be able to go to um, a Greek Orthodox church where someone could teach Greek and culture to a group. So you'd have an affinity group who would be interested in the culture, but the aggregate might be a great deal more money coming. Just a thought. Okay. Other questions? Um, given that you are all kind of coming into these new areas and trying to lead in them, can you talk about the role that um, mentorship has played in your experience? And um, specifically, I'm interested in hearing from everyone, but specifically um, Jacob, knowing how many layers there are to navigate in opening a charter school. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I can honestly say when I started doing this, and really to this day, I have no idea what I'm doing. And I'm woefully unqualified to be doing it. Um, so it's been teaching in general, and I think um, leading a school is a pretty isolating experience. You oftentimes work by yourself. So it's been really important for me to try to find mentors and other people who have come before me just to ask them when something happens, some big challenge comes up, just to be able to reach out to them. Kind of ties in, I think, to that intellectual property question. One thing that I love about the charter school movement, just education reform in general, is people are really open about what they do, how they do it, why they get the results that they do. So I've never felt like I have not been able to pick up a phone and call anybody, whether I know them or not, in this world. Um, it's something that I've definitely really benefited from, and we try to, to pay it forward when other people are working to open charter schools now and, and come and ask questions. Um, but so. Uh, I have a formal mentor that um, was an executive director of a charter school for five years and now no longer does it, but I speak to him every two weeks. And then I have sort of an informal network of other charter school leaders that uh, I check in with pretty regularly as well. Yeah, there's, there's a question here. Hi, I just have a question for catchafire.com and all the internet-based uh, projects. Um, from what I see from the Catch Fire, a lot of your models are quite similar with uh, normal HR websites that matches skills with um, employees. And I can see, and I've seen, that um, people have, or companies have done it for free and done it as uh, their CSR models that they just convert it or have a session from the HR websites into a website like yours. So I just wonder how are you going to stop um, people I mean, websites like that um, cutting into your profits and your sustainabilities. And for all the other internet-based projects, um, the thing with internet is 
once people see your ideas, it's quite easy to replicate. And once the well, it's a great thing that people come up with good ideas and, and do it on their own when they see good ideas. How are you going to sustain it if a lot of similar websites have come up? Can I ask you what specific human resources websites you're talking about? Um, not in America, but I've seen some uh, similar, very similar websites uh, in, in Asia. Do uh, you remember the names? Because I would love that just for my own sake. Um, but to you know, answer your question about other volunteer matching players, here in the United States is you know, the, the market that I know and that I understand well. Um, and it's not that there aren't volunteer matching sites. There's ones that we all know well, Volunteer Match, Idealist, Tappert. Tappert is actually not online, but Volunteer Match and Idealist, they have a different model. Their model is more of a Craigslist style where the nonprofit actually lists a volunteer project that they create on their own. We're very different because we've actually created our own project menu and we work more like an eHarmony or a Match.com where the nonprofit actually you know, the volunteer gets a list, a tailored list of volunteer opportunities that match exactly who they are. And then on the flip side, the nonprofit gets one specific volunteer match. And that's very different from any other existing site. Um, and then to answer your question about, you know, if we're doing well, obviously internet sites are easy to copy and that's fair. Um, but the reality is for our site, we're creating a community. and so that community is more difficult to replicate. I mean, you can you know, make the argument for Yelp. Yelp is a relatively easy technology business to replicate, but why isn't it that you know, other players have taken over from Yelp because they have a community, I would argue, is one of the main reasons. I'll answer that quickly for Journey Universal. So, so what will be defensible about the, the site that we build? And it, it will be two things. So, so first will be relationships with the blood centers and contracts with them. There's only so many of them. And if you have relationships with them, then, um, then, then that's one way to def defend the idea. The second is um, I hope to build a massive database of blood donors. And if I have a million, several million people in my database, that will be a, a big obstacle for a competitor to come in to try to build that. So, so I'll, I'll be able to create value for blood centers by by having this database. Okay, so, uh, did you want to say something? No, go ahead. Oh. Um, obviously, this was very, very difficult for the judges to, to pick the winner. And Marin here was kind enough to do all the compilation, and there's a $500 prize here to the winner. And you're all winners, so there isn't just one, <laughs> there isn't just one that stands out. But I'm going, to, I'm going to end before I announce the winner in one second, just by telling you a little story. It's kind of a joke. <laughs> but it has something to do with what makes successful people. And it's about a duck. And a duck walks in a bar and he says, do you got any grapes? The bartender looks at him and says, I don't have any grapes. Beat it, will you? Next day, the bartender opens a bar and walks a duck. And the duck says, you got any grapes? The bartender says, get out of here. I told you, we sell wine and liquor. We don't sell grapes. I'll beat it. Third day, Duck comes in and says, he says, if you come in here again, I'm going to nail your little web foot to the floor. You understand? Duck says, oh, OK, goes out. Next day, sure enough, the duck shows up. The duck walks up and says, you got any nails? The guy says, no, I don't have any nails. He says, good, then you got any grapes? <laughs> and it's about persistence. You just keep going and you never quit, OK? So I'm going to turn over to Marion. Why don't you introduce the winner for us, OK? Would you do that? Because I think you did the tallying, and I think, I think you'll all be delighted. OK? Uh, the winner is? Jacob from Coney Island Prep. Jacob. We, uh, we don't have a gigantic yeah, check for you, but um, <laughs> feel free to. No, thank you very much for including me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. You're all doing fabulous things, and like I said, you're all winners. And, and thank you for this audience. It's very attentive and very helpful, and I know you admire what's going on here. What's going on, I'm sure you've had a long day, you've seen many people, you've met some interesting people, we want you to stay involved. This is very important to the Columbia community and all we do. I wonder if there's any time for the judges to just say what was the most, most effective, or is there not time to do that? 
well, I don't think we want to analyze it too much, but I think I think it's good that we, we leave it to where it is. And again, I thank you because I know that you all probably had a long day and we'll let you go. So thank you very much.